anyway, welcome everybody. We're glad you're here. Um, and I appreciate Ken's willingness to um, participate. Uh, Clark and I had a chance to to go ride uh, the train up in Duluth, the North Shore Scenic, and uh, Ken graciously sat with us on the entire trip and we were talking about trains and he was telling us how they got the funding through the Minnesota legislature. And one of one of the brilliant things they did was go after veterans groups. And when I heard that, I asked him if he would join us and tell us about this program. Um, like he said, he didn't do it, but he knows what happened. So I'm going to turn it over to Ken. If you don't know him, you need to go to Duluth and ride the train. He's uh, Mr. Uh, Duluth Museum, and he knows everything about it because he's running the show. <laughs> well, thank you for this opportunity. I'll try to be brief and leave some time for questions. Um, we went out, and like I say, I had nothing to do with this, uh, but we hired Jill Brown, who's a private consultant, and uh, she managed our grassroots effort under the direction of the Joint Powers Alliance, of which my connection is that I am chair uh, of the Joint Powers Alliance Technical Advisory Committee. So um, that means I don't have to stand for election every year. And uh, I've been with the project since the very beginning and uh, with fits and starts through the entire process, as I'm sure you are all aware of. So I don't think I'm breaking any new ground here or causing any new consternation. The grassroots efforts that we did started off with uh, county fairs along the corridor. Uh, we hired people to go and man a booth or person a booth rather uh, with information, handouts, folders, and then we took uh, names and registrations uh, for building our email list, uh, which is over 1,500 at this particular point. We expanded on the fairs. Um, once we identified which legislators were for our project and which legislators were against our project. Once we had that and then isolated it to the county fairs, we were able to have postcards. And there were two different postcards uh, that you could sign uh, one was to, uh, if your legislator, be, a, be it senator or representative, was supportive, your postcard was, uh, thank you for your support. Um, we are in favor of this, and uh, please, if there's anything we can do to, to help you, let us know. If they were identified as being against the project, um, then they got a different postcard that said, um, we are in favor of this. We want this. We don't understand why it hasn't happened already. And um, here's my mailing address. Uh, and then those were uh, bundled up and hand delivered uh, to the supporters or the non-supporters and their offices at the state capitol um, when they were uh, in session. So we planned a year ahead after we knew who was for and who was against so that during the start of the session, we were able to say, these are the postcards from the constituents in your district that were captured at last year's state fair, and um, you should you should read them. And they also had places for private messages as well. Um, as for the veterans, um, one of the selling points of the Northern Lights Express has always been that uh, once you transfer to the blue line uh, at Target Field, you can take the blue line down and there is a stop at the VA hospital in Minneapolis and you are literally um, a couple hundred feet from the front door. And there is wheelchair access from the uh, station, from the blue line station right into the VA hospital. And why that's important is because there is a VA hospital in Superior, um, it's a clinic and they're full. They can't take another patient until somebody dies. So what happens is everybody along the line, and this is from Cambridge all the way up to Minnesota's glorious Iron Range and up the North Shore. If you have a VA appointment and are unable to make it on your own, uh, the VA runs uh, a series of uh, shuttle vans uh, from different VFWs and American Legion posts along the route. And so you get there at about five o'clock in the morning and they drive you down to the VA hospital. Uh, the drivers are as old as most of the patients. And if the driver doesn't go, the patients don't go. If you're in a van and you have a 10 o'clock appointment, but there's a patient with a four o'clock appointment, you're going to wait 
until that four o'clock appointment is done before you go home. And because there's such a number, for instance, St. Louis County alone has over 40,000 veterans. Because of that, and we're, we're one of the bigger ones, that is true. Because of that, the vans are often full, which means that your spouse sometimes cannot get to go with you. So we took this message to VFWs and American Legions up and down the line. And I can't tell you the number of presentations that between Jill and myself we have made, and sometimes to three or four times. In fact, there's one VFW here in Duluth that I speak at every single year because they're so enthusiastic. And of course, our takeaway from all of these is, here are your representatives that are for this. Here are your representatives that are not for this yet. And we have used that, and um, that was very, very effective, extremely effective, uh, particularly with our congressman, who is not at all a fan of this project, but sits on the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and uh, had been a vocal opponent of this uh, project during his uh, first campaign. And um, as was his predecessor, by the way, uh, the as soon as Congressman Oberstar uh, failed to run, what I know about elections is if you want to get voted in office, you've got to run a campaign. <laughs> and um, when Congressman Oberstar's people failed to run a campaign on his behalf, uh, we've had Republicans, uh, and then we had a couple Democrats. We had one Democrat that came for a while, and then we have another Republican in. Uh, the first Republican was very vocal against it and could not be swayed. Our current Congressman, who is also a Republican, was against it, campaigned against it because his predecessor, a Democrat, was for it. Uh, when we took him his letters and postcards from the VFW post in his district, uh, that at least gave him pause because he's a veteran himself and veterans uh, affair and veterans concerns are extremely important to the congressman. Um, he stopped being a vocal opponent. Uh, I don't know what his private thoughts are. I'm sure he's still against it, but he stopped being a vocal opponent. So the VA and the veterans voices uh, for Northern Lights Express played a huge part in uh, securing the funding. At every uh, time we testified uh, between the House and Senate, any one of the committees that our bill was before, uh, we had a veteran speak. Uh, luckily, we had a veteran uh, from the Duluth area who was extremely articulate and uh, very passionate and um, was quite vocal about uh, how he personally had been inconvenienced. And by the way, he's currently dying of Parkinson's disease and needs that treatment. And uh, his testimony was extremely powerful. And you only need one or two veterans to get you in to a program because they're always, always, always looking for programs. And it was always, the entry was always about, hey, would you like to hear about a train ride to the Minneapolis area to see a ball game or something? And always ended with um, the story that, that I would tell about one morning when I was out in Washington and um, I'm an early riser and so was Congressman Oberstar. So I got to his office and when he came in, I was waiting for him. The rest of our group hadn't shown up yet because I was early for the meeting. So he invited me in. We sat and had a cup of coffee or something. And I told him about the, the VA thing. And I said, I know it's going to be an Amtrak train. And I know that, uh, you know, we're not going to have much say in ticketing and this, that, and the other thing. I said, but Congressman, wouldn't it be nice if because of all the federal money that's going to be poured into this project that a veteran couldn't get online and say, I'm coming down and I've got this and here's my appointment and here's my number and here's my everything. And a little sign would pop up and say, thank you for your service, your ride is free. And the Congressman said, I want that. So we haven't given up on that yet. We'll be talking about it later, but uh, because of the convenience of getting right to the front door of the VA, it had a powerful, powerful selling point. We did a lot of other things too. We did billboards, uh, we did, um, uh, media campaigns. We uh, spent uh, seventy-eight thousand dollars this last year in targeting messages to uh, districts for and opposed to the project. I don't think we changed one opposition vote, 
but I know we helped carry the uh, House and Senate and kept them united uh, so there were no defections. Um, but I don't think we, we got no Republican vote. So I guess the best lobbying effort I can tell you is elect Democrats. Yeah. <laughs> we we knew that one already. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are wonderful. You got a trifecta there. Yes. We, we, yeah. And that's and quite honestly, you know, um, that's what did it. Um, we always had the governor. We always had the house. And last, uh, here's one quick example. So last year we got full funding from the governor. We got full funding in the house from Speaker Hortman, and we didn't even get a hearing in yeah. one Senate committee. And that's just wrong. I mean, yeah. vote against it all you want, but you hear every bill. You just do. That's what you do. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of those Republicans didn't get reelected was because they were so obstinate. I wish it worked that way universally. Then I wouldn't have to worry about the next presidential election. <laughs> well, I think it, it, it is unrealistic for us to hope to have anything like that happen here the way this state has been gerrymandered and 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 lobbied. Um, so, uh, however, I like the idea of the veterans, I must say. Yeah, we certainly did. And are there any questions for Ken? Because I promised Ken he'd be first <laughs> on the agenda, and then when we're done with him, he can go on about his day. Well, Ken, uh, this is Gary. Uh, thank you for everything that you do. And uh, I know what a battle it was in... Uh, Minnesota, and you inspire us to keep going. Um, what has helped us is that the we are wearing down the Republican opposition to interstate cooperation. And Minnesota really, and you had your issues with the state Senate there, but I'm glad that Chris and Rick are on the call because they have helped as well. This is a point that I have noticed in our lobbying effort is helping because the Republicans are saying, oh, we need to reduce the scope of government. We don't need four fire departments. We don't need one in Golden Valley and one in Wyzetta and one in Bemidji and we just combine them, right? Uh, but that interstate cooperation, I'd like to focus on as a success story because it makes them look totally illogical and and uh, unprepared for the future. And I think you've really done that. Uh, Nona and Clark know this, most of the people on the call. This fall in October, the 23rd and 24th and 25th of October, is the two-state Minnesota-Wisconsin Public Transit Conference. Now, I'm proud to say that uh, 26 years ago, I, uh, through the, the Wisconsin Transit Association, approached the Minnesota and said, how about if we did a joint conference every couple of years? And the first one, and, I, and they said, why would you want to do that? And I said, because we have David Obi and you have Jim Oberstar. And those two congressional districts carry all the weight in the transportation field. Phil was involved in this from the very start. And so the tradition carries on. So this year we are in La Crosse. So these conventions have gone back and forth between the two states every three years. Minnesota at first, who was the woman that was your transportation commissioner and she was Lieutenant governor and owned all those uh, truck stops, Petro or whatever it was called. She would throw a barrel 50 feet. She was that kind of a, you know, Western Minnesota. It's Michelle Fishbach. Yeah, Fishbach, yes. Transportation, yeah. Fishbach, and uh, she is, uh, the person that she ousted was the ranking Republican on the Agriculture Committee in an area of Minnesota that is second only to the Red River Valley in wow. an agricultural area. Um, but this year, um, our annual meeting for All Aboard Wisconsin is tentatively scheduled for Monday morning, October 23rd at this conference. So we have, when this conference has been scheduled, they offer us a free space in La Crosse. 
Now, our board has not finalized all the plans for this yet, and it's difficult for transportation and costs, but several people on these calls have been um, have done this. And as you might remember, we did this in Superior uh, a couple years ago where we honored the mayor of Superior in the train car uh, that you helped us get, uh, and it was really good. Uh, so I just, I just wanted to point out that that interstate cooperation is something we can sell. We also have Governor Pritzker, who has taken a very strong attachment um, to Wisconsin politics, uh, being able to help out financially. And uh, I had a chance to see him recently in Lake Geneva. He came up to do a reception for Tammy Baldwin. He says, <laughs> I, I really wanted to ask him the money question, but I just didn't, I, there were too many people, but I just appreciate I wanted to underscore how much we appreciate the work that's done because I can use that in the work that we, those of us that are advocates can use that in the work um, that we've done. Ken, uh, you obviously have a very nice budget and this was of course helpful to move all of your work forward. And I'm wondering specifically about uh, your consultant, Jill Brown, and I'm not asking what you paid her, but in general, what kind of a budget price did you put on hiring a consultant to put together your grassroots um, program? Our grassroots program has gone from a low of uh, $22,000 some years to a high of 100, and I believe we are at 158, even maybe a little higher last year. Uh, we had some reserve funds that we were able to put towards it. Uh, Hennepin County, when they smelled that there might be success uh, in this project, rejoined. And because we'd already made up our budget, uh, their membership fee went straight to marketing and grassroots efforts. Uh, so we were able to use our surplus um, and the new money from Hennepin County and um, what we normally budget. And we were right around... Well, I want to say about 148, 154, somewhere in that about $150,000. And that included Jill's pay and uh, billboards and the uh, uh, geofencing messaging and the times at the state fair and uh, and all of that. So, um, and like I say, but it's been as low as, you know, 18 to $20,000 too. So um, it, it's, it's vacillated greatly, but this was the year that we all said, let's go for broke and we did. Oh, we also got, no, it was higher than that, because we also got special allocation from the city of Duluth and St. Louis County that each put in an additional above their regular amounts to be members of the Joint Powers Alliance. Each also put in an additional $25,000 uh, from the city of Duluth. All the money comes from the hotel motel tourism tax fund. The county just allocated it. Thank you. Now, I had a question uh, because um, I'm obviously interested in the Milwaukee Green Bay route, and outside of Milwaukee, the gerrymander means that there's only uh, two Democrats in the Assembly <clears throat> and no senators. Um, we had chosen as the group that's interested, in, particularly in the Green Bay route, to concentrate on getting mayors and people like uh, county board members uh, to support it along with chambers of commerce and the like, um, working on the principle that uh, that if chambers of commerce start going along with this, then eventually a few Republicans will start to follow. Um, what do you think of that as a strategy? Well, we worked with uh, Chambers of Commerce and we found them to be quite supportive and um, and they were testifying for us. Um, I would say as far as changing, like I say, we changed no Republican minds. Uh, we had two um, representatives that were right along the line. Uh, both were union supporters. And of course, we had SMART in there and the IBEW and a couple other unions as well. We had Chambers of Commerce. Um, and like I say, the one, uh, representative was himself, uh, IBEW member. 
And uh, we had the IBEW state uh, write and endorse the project, and that was uh, unable to sway. Chambers of Commerce are nice, but they don't have any money to spend. So uh, we stuck with governments and rail authorities uh, to uh, pony up the funds to keep the thing running. One question I had, when you guys sent people out to the Minnesota State Fair, was that difficult to get uh, a slot to get in there? Because I know often there's a lot of people that want to go there and they, they're on a waiting no, no, list. No, 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 no. If I, if I said State Fair, I apologize. We oh. went to county fairs. Oh, county fairs. Okay. County fairs, you can get a booth for about 50 bucks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that we, we, we were, there's no way you, we could afford the state fair. You can get in, but you're buried um, and it's thousands and thousands of dollars. Plus you got to staff it for, you know, two weeks. Yeah. Uh, a, a county fair, uh, about 50, 60 bucks will get you in. And um, you only have to staff the daytime hours. Uh, and there's only three or four days. So that's, we went to the county fairs. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Definitely cheaper. I was just over to the Minnesota State fair this weekend it's like 18 dollars just to get in the gate right. and then let alone the food prices most, and... most county fairs these days are free yeah yeah good good point one thing that i was just going to ask you ken the joint powers alliance that you had what what kind of legal decision making did you guys have i was just always kind of curious in in that particular case how that alliance worked the Joint Powers Alliance was formed uh, to have a block so that you had something to join other than just a nonprofit organization. A Joint Powers Alliance has to have board members that are elected officials. Not all of them have to be elected officials, but if it's not an elected official that's on the Joint Powers Board, it must the person representing that jurisdiction or that membership must be appointed by an elected body. So that's why I'm the chair of the Technical Advisory Committee, as opposed to a JPA member, because I don't have any elected officials behind me that can say, hey, Ken should do this. So I kind of stuck in the back door. Uh, but the Joint Powers Alliance is made up of elected officials or representatives of elected bodies. And even the elected officials have to be voted on by their body. For instance, uh, Janet Kennedy, counselor and uh, chair of the Duluth City Council, she needs the vote of her fellow counselors to put her on the GPA. Um, the GPA, the other reason it was formed was we needed, and we had to change state law for this. Um, early on, we knew the Black's Band would be a powerful member of this because, of course, who's going to benefit from a stop in Hinkley more than the Grand Casino? <laughs> so we knew they were going to be a powerful partner. We had to go to the state uh, constitution it was an easy fix. It took a legislative session. We had to actually change, uh, not the Constitution, but change the, the rules of a joint powers alliance to allow for a sovereign entity uh, like a band to be members. So we pioneered that. And now um, ever since you know we did that, uh, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe have been a very strong partner of ours and a large financial contributor. One other thing I was just going to ask you too, Ken, when the Alliance or the NLX project applied to the Corridor ID program, would the Joint Powers Alliance have any uh, jurisdiction or say in the grant application if you're applying for grants or, or doesn't sure how that process worked for you guys? We won't uh, there is a real story point. to this. Yeah. Uh, when we got the finding of no significant impact in 2018, mm -hmm. which was the culmination of about 13 years of the 23 we've been at it because it took us a while to get to the point where we could have funding enough to pay the 13 and a half million dollars that we invested to get the finding of no significant impact. And then we handed that over to the state of Minnesota, which is the proper way to do it. And the state of Minnesota through MnDOT then became the liaison with the federal government. Um, the Joint Powers Alliance is still here. We still are very vocal very active. We're going to Washington in the end of October. Uh, we will continue to do what MnDOT cannot do, which is lobby and to promote and to hold MnDOT's feet to the fire uh, to uh, make sure that these uh, deadlines for these different grants are done and uh, done professionally. Um, as you know, MnDOT is terribly underfunded and under-resourced when it comes to freight and passenger rail projects in the state of Minnesota. And we are lobbying actively on their behalf to increase that number of people that can work on this project and the amount of money that the uh, 
uh, MnDOT can put towards these people and their activities. I, Thank you. Matt, I have a question. Um, is the Joint Powers uh, uh, Board, is that geographically limited? No. In fact, um, depending upon who becomes our chair uh, next year, one of the things that the Joint Powers Alliance is going to do is recruit more members. Um, now, to vote, you got to pay. That's it's 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 not this is not an honorary position. This is something you buy your way into. But we would like to see, and we're going to work on different levels of membership. Maybe non-voting members, or maybe I don't know, maybe a group of non-voting members that get one vote or something like that. This is something we're going to work on. Uh, between now and the end of the year with the idea of expanding our membership so that when we go to Washington, D.C. in the spring of uh, 2024, instead of saying, well, there are 13 members to the Joint Powers Alliance, we want to say there are 30 members to the Joint Powers Alliance. Makes sense. So what is it? Did it take legislation to, to create the Joint Powers Alliance? Well, he explained about the constitutional. Yeah, no, yeah, not constitution. I'm sorry, but state but, uh, regulations for setting up a GPA. Um, we did not include sovereign nations. Anybody can set up a GPA as long as you've got different units of government that want to work together. And there are plenty of GPAs in the state of Wisconsin or the state of Minnesota, rather. Uh, one of the biggest ones is the Arrowhead Regional Juvenile System, which is a GPA uh, or JPA. Uh, Joint Powers Alliance of all the counties in the Arrowhead region sharing uh, juvenile uh, detention centers. So they're quite common between different jurisdictions, cities, counties, whatever. Uh, but up until us, they never included a sovereign nation. So that was the change. Okay. That was the change. But but it's not. Gary, do you know of anything in the Wisconsin Constitution that would prevent a similar association a similar group no um i'm taking copious notes uh um we have um what, what section uh 33 of our statutes allows units of government to cooperate um and so you're going to see some start of this through WEDEC, the wisconsin economic development corporation um where there could be like northeast wisconsin or south central wisconsin entities that form to deal with economic issues in an area. Um, obviously, this model um, is really worth worth pursuing for us. We have not had the luxury of um, being able to do the grassroots thing and had to really focus with our limited abilities and resources to just focus on the legislature at this time. <clears throat> and so that this would take some greater planning and involvement. Uh, what started, what we started with um, were the rail authorities. In other words, the first thing we did was we got the rail authorities together. Right. St. Louis right. uh, has one, Anoka County had one, uh, uh, Hennepin County had one, and those were the three founders. And then they pulled in Minneapolis and Pine County, and we went from there. And can we have rail commissions? Because our constitution was not changed until 1994 when the public monies could be invested in any rail. So before that, there were rail commissions of which this group, this group of people can tell you a lot about. So that may be a good starting point for us because they are funded yes. today through local units of government. In fact, the one in Northern Wisconsin has expanded um, a lot. That's a very good suggestion. Gary, would we run into any problems with the issue of the resolutions that basically prohibited the regional no. transit authorities? Uh, no. Our, um, obviously, we have the same issues in that Minnesota did with their state Senate. We have it in both the Assembly and the Senate. We have chairs of the transportation community uh, committees that are violently, very viciously opposed to any of this rail expansion. But we, like you, have a governor for the next three and one half years that uh, is there. And we have a railroad commissioner, a new railroad commissioner, that is going to take a more active role who comes from 
uh, local areas. Uh, and we have uh, a determination of our Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Missy Hughes, a name you will hear from Ken, is considering running from the third congressional district in Wisconsin, which hugs the Minnesota border from St. Croix County all the way down to Iowa. Um, and she knows Tim Walz, your governor. They've worked on some things. So it's possible somebody like that could emerge and bring these issues up. But we as a group can talk this over. And maybe um, if there are any documents you could send us from that you care to share, that would be helpful because we can put our heads together and see what we might be able to do. The Secretary of State's office in Minnesota has all of that online. Oh, okay. All right. Is it in the basement of the Capitol with only 10 square feet like ours? <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. I just know that uh, the Secretary of State in Minnesota uh, keeps track of just about everything. I love it. That's very good to know. They don't they don't believe in keeping their public records secret like no, uh, no, some other uh, states. It's actually pretty easy to access. Wonderful. And thank you for sharing your secrets with us. Um, I had a couple of questions. They aren't secrets. They aren't secrets. <laughs> um, the, the Joint Powers uh, Alliance that you mentioned, is that formally known as the Minneapolis Duluth Superior Passenger Rail Alliance? Is that? Yeah, that is correct. Okay. I wanted to just make sure of that. Also, um, what, what you uh, shared about the how helpful the veteran support was, was really interesting. And I wondered if in the work that you did with them, did any of them mention a need or a desire to travel to VA facilities in Wisconsin, like Madison or Toma or you know places like that. Uh, we spoke to groups in Superior, and uh, quite honestly, most of them go to the VA hospital in Minneapolis. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And also, does anybody know if the TCMC might be running in time for this uh, meeting in La Crosse that Jerry mentioned? <laughs> I, I wouldn't hold my breath if I. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> and can I um, just pass on something to you and everybody? I've shared it with most of the people on this group. Um, I contacted the state senator from Ashland, Wisconsin. Uh, his name is Romaine Quinn and represents the city of Superior. It is our understanding that the state of Wisconsin that did not allocate any dollars for its share of the Amtrak costs for the line once it hits the Wisconsin border and goes up to Superior. So um, that would have to be a separate amendment or a vote here in our state. The I've, I've said this often, and I think you've heard me at the TCMC passed by the hair of its chinny chin chin, like 50 cents more than it than at the lowest figure they could give it. So it's very tight in that regard, but we don't wanna be a stumbling block to the successful completion of that line if we need to fight a battle in our legislature on a small amount of state dollars that would go into this. We're, we're, we're working on that. Um, we understand the, the shortfall, the difficulty. Um, obviously we have the support of the governor, but that's yeah. not enough. And um, it's gonna be, it's going to be interesting. We don't need the money from Wisconsin. We want the money from Wisconsin. There's a big oh, difference. Okay. All right. I thought Amtrak insisted that each state pay its part. They will have to pay their part for operation. Ah. They do not have to pay their part for the build out. Ah, okay. The build out, the 20% is fully matched by the state of Minnesota. We don't need Wisconsin's money. We want Wisconsin money to make our application look better, but we'll never get it by the end of the year when the federal state program, when the partnership program is going to be considered. So the next thing then is to try to get it somewhere along the line. And, um, but if the line is built, or listen to me, yeah. when the line is built, um, the, uh, the state will have to pay its share. Right. Uh, I gotta get going. If it's all right, I thank you for this opportunity. Um, good luck. We will do anything uh, to help you that we can. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, one train helps all trains. Yeah. <laughs> we believe well that. Said. Thank you again, Ken. I'll see you in the ninth, Ken. All right. Good night. Thank you, Ken.